And so today, friends, we want to go ahead and jump into the Word. Is that all right? And so I want to invite those online. I need you to be some uh, digital disciples. I need you to be Apple apostles. I need you to be electronic evangelists. If you're on Facebook, hit the share button a couple times. If you're on YouTube, copy that link and send it to somebody as we go into the Word. And so for those who are with me in person today, go ahead and stand to your feet as we get into it today. Go with me a couple places in your Bible this afternoon. We're going to start over in Matthew chapter 12, and we'll read one verse in verse 40. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. But go ahead and put your, your, your good finger over in the book of Jonah chapter 1, which is where we will ultimately land today. Matthew chapter 12, and we'll look together at verse 40. Anybody stand in need of a word from the Lord today? Amen. I just need to know where to aim this sermon today. And then my other question, do I have anybody that has ever been through a storm in life? Yeah, I need you to know I got something that will allow you to see the goodness of God even in life's storms. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. When you get there, just say, Pastor, I'm here. Matthew 12 and verse 40. The Bible says, for just Jesus speaking, says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of what? In the heart of the earth. And so again, Jonah's experience was a foreshadowing of what Christ would do at the resurrection. Now go with me, if you don't mind, to the book of Jonah, chapter 1, there in the Old Testament. The book of Jonah, chapter 1 right there between Obadiah and Micah. (laughs) I don't know if that helps some of (laughs) y'all. Jonah chapter 1, and we're going to look together at verse number 1, and we'll do a good bit of reading uh, so it's kind of help expedite things. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1, when you get there, let me hear you say amen. The Bible says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh that great city and cry out against it for their wickedness has come up before me but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish so he paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of who he's running from the presence of God you know you can't hide from God No matter how hard you try, you cannot outrun the convicting, wooing, inviting love of Jesus Christ. Then the Bible says in verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise and call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us and what is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you? that the sea may be calm for us. For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said unto them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. And therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased to you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. 
and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Watch this. But the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Chapter 2 and verse 10, he's in the belly of the fish. Jonah spends some time in prayer. And then the Bible says in verse 10, So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Today, saints, for just a little while, with your prayers and God's help, I want to talk under the subject, you're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. Let's pray together. Father, Lord, would you apply extraordinary anointing to this ordinary man? Father, I'm praying that you would give us an immense measure of your spirit that the word would go forward unhindered and in a way that is pointed and hopeful and directive for the body of Christ. And so, Lord, I'm praying that in the hearing of the word, that faith will be multiplied exponentially. Lord, would you please hide me in the shadows of the cross, that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone might be heard. And at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. We ask this in the name of him who is altogether lovely. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Let those who believe shout together, amen. And amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord today. Again, talking on the subject, you're going in the wrong way. You know, friends, the Christian journey is not about how good or how bad you are. It's not about how righteous or how wicked you are. The Christian journey is actually about how submitted you are. And the reason that certain gospel promises have not become gospel realities is because we've never fully divested ownership of our lives and submitted to the sovereign lordship of Jesus Christ. And the truth is that there are a number who've been baptized, but they've never been fully submitted there are some who come to church, but they've never been fully submitted. There are some who lead ministries, but they've never been fully submitted. And the truth is that some of us are not disciples of Christ. We are volunteers of Christ because volunteers serve as it is convenient when there is agreement and as far as it benefits them. And what I need somebody to get is that a partially submitted person is the same as an unsubmitted person. You see, like Jonah, we want to do God's will our way. We want to do God's will on our own terms, and we want to do God's will in our own time frame. And I need you to gather this truth about submission because submission is not, man, the absence of choice. Neither is it, man, an act of slavery. I want to give you a definition for submission. Submission is simply the voluntary alignment with an authority based upon belief in that authority's character, mission, ability, and judgment. In other words, when I submit to God, it's because I believe in his character, his vision, his ability, and his judgment. And the thing about submission is that it is not one thing I do at conversion. Submission is a daily act for the believer. And the thing somebody's got to get is that submission is not just arbitrary obedience. Submission is an act of trust 
trust in the sovereignty of God. In other words, friends, when I submit to God, it is because I believe in his character, because God has been good to me. It's because I believe in his mission, the gospel going to the world. I believe in his ability that God does all things well. I believe in his judgment that God knows what's best for me. And I need somebody to know that submission doesn't begin with obedience. Submission actually begins with what you believe. You see, submission is the belief in where God is leading me. Submission is belief that God knows which way to go. Submission is the belief that God is able to bring me through. Submission is the belief that God knows which way to take me. Submission is radical so trust in God that allows me to follow him even when I don't know where he's leading me. I need you to know that submission is an act of faith. Are y'all with me today? In fact, I saw, man, a great demonstration of faith a few weeks ago when I was in the city of Arizona. You see, in Arizona, one of the rages of the city are these automated Uber cars so that these Teslas will come and pick you up. And these Teslas have no driver in the front seat. You just type in where you're wanting to go, and guess what? You sit back, and the Tesla takes you where you need to be. Now, aim brave enough enough to do it myself, but I enjoyed watching other people do it online. And, and the crazy thing is, friends, is that even though your hand is not on the wheel, you're still considered the driver. And, and see, I need you to get that, man, you don't tell the car which way to go. You don't tell it how fast it should travel. You don't alarm it where the traffic may be. You just sit back and let it lead you because you've got such trust in the brand. You've got such trust in the navigation. You've got such trust in the technology that you sit in the back and let it take you where you're supposed to be. And I guess what I'm saying, church, is if they have that much trust in Elon Musk, if they've got that much trust in a computer, if they've got that much trust in a GPS, how much more should we be trusting the God of heaven and earth, the God that does all things well? I don't need to tell him where to go. I don't need to give him the directions. I just sit in the back seat, and Jesus is not my co-pilot. Jesus is the actual pilot leading me where I need to be. Are y'all with me today, friends? And so let's get into this word today. And my prayer is that I won't keep you long. I won't promise it. I just pray for it. Come on and say amen today. Now, now again, friends, the story of Jonah is actually filled with a variety of uncomfortable truths. You see, the first thing that the story of Jonah teaches us is that agreement is not a prerequisite for obedience. Let me say it again. That, that it teaches us that agreement is not a prerequisite for obedience. In other words, in order to be an all the way in Christian, I don't have to be all the way in agreement with what God says. And when you look at the story, friends, the issue is not that Jonah doesn't understand the assignment. The issue is that Jonah just doesn't agree with the assignment. In other words, Jonah has been called to prophesy against the city of Nineveh before calamity and destruction comes upon it. Now, recall that uh, uh, Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and the Assyrians are the arch enemies of Israel. And to be clear that Nineveh's wickedness is not that it's just a great city to go and turn up. Nineveh is a bloodthirsty city city with great cruelty and violence that makes it unsafe to even walk down the street. And the Bible says it's so bad that its wickedness comes up before the Lord. And so God commissions Jonah to go and preach before destruction comes. But the problem, friends, is that Jonah doesn't like the folk in Nineveh. He feels like they deserve their destruction, that their calamity 
empathy is warranted. In other words, it's not a lack of understanding. There's just a lack of agreement. And what Jonah learns the hard way is that God doesn't make suggestions. Uh, do I have a witness that knows that God doesn't give recommendations? that God doesn't give advice. God just lays out assignments for those who are his children to execute. Are y'all with me today? And see, friends, I need somebody to know this about the struggle of faith, that the biggest struggle of faith is not just me believing for God to provide what I need. The biggest part of faith is not just waiting on God to answer a prayer. The most hard part of faith is not just waiting on his word to come to pass. The hardest part of faith is having to obey what God said when I don't agree with what God said. Uh, has anybody ever had a time where God's word or his will for you just didn't make sense? Uh, go ahead. It's not in your secret. You can agree with me today. There are some times where his will or his expressed word just did not make sense as far as you could digest it. For some, it did not make sense to have to leave a job after you've invested so much time into it. There are some that it didn't make sense when God relocated you here to Huntsville. There are times where the word doesn't make sense that the offended have to go according to Matthew 18 and seek out the offender. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to give 10% of an already obligated salary to God. At times it doesn't make sense to bless those that curse you and pray for those that mean you harm. Sometimes it didn't make sense that God assigned leadership to you at this stage in your life. But let me say plainly to someone one today that at times God's will won't make sense on the front end. In other words, I need you to be clear that there will be times where you question what God said because it does not line up with common sense or the judgment of this world. In fact, read your Bibles, friends. It didn't make sense to Abraham to have to sacrifice his son Isaac on the mountain. It didn't make sense for Israel to march down toward a closed Red Sea. It didn't make sense for Gideon to whittle his arm me down to 300. It didn't make sense for the disciples to pray over two fish and five loaves. It didn't make sense for the 10 lepers to show themselves to a priest while they still had leprosy. It didn't make sense to the disciples that Jesus would allow himself to be crucified and handed over to the authorities of the time. But I need you to know that there are certain things that won't make sense until after you obey. Let me say it again. There are certain things that won't make sense until after you obey. In other words, Abraham didn't see the ram in the thicket until he began to obey. That Israel didn't see the Red Sea open until they began to obey. That Gideon didn't know that God could win with many or few until after he obeyed. That the disciples didn't know the two fish and five could feed 5,000 until after they obeyed. For the 10 lepers, they didn't start getting well until after they obeyed. And they didn't know what he meant in crucifixion until after the resurrection, after he obeyed what God told him to do. And what I'm saying to somebody today is that you'll never see the miracle until after you forgive those who don't deserve it. You'll never see what God has in the future until you uh, eliminate the relationship of the past. That you'll never see how God will provide until you give when you don't have it. How many of us know that God doesn't have to make sense because God made sense? Oh, we all at today. God does not have to answer to our logic. We simply have to trust God when we cannot trace God. Are y'all with me today, friends? 
Listen, I remember probably about seven years ago uh, when my wife and I were getting ready to build the home where we live in now. And, and I remember, you know, we get to the place where you pay a certain house for a price for the base house, and then you budget some money for your upgrades. And, and my wife and my realtor, Jessica, burned through our upgrade money like an electrical fire. It was gone before I knew it. And, and I remember, Malcolm, I wanted a back a fence in the backyard so that the kids could go and play uh, unsupervised and just go and do their thing. But the money had pretty much already been gone. And so, man, I was thankful for how God blessed. But in my secret time, I was like, Lord, I wish that we could get, man, a fence in the backyard. But, man, how many of us know the devil has a special attack for the closing week? In other words, man, stuff started happening in underwriting. Man, the house was not finished on time. We had to stay another month in that uh, rental house. And it's crazy because I wanted to back out of the deal. I wanted to go and look for something else. But the Spirit of the Lord kept leading us to this same house. I didn't understand it. I just had to accept it even though I didn't agree with it. But now as we get back to the closing table, the builders can recognize my frustration and my anger. And so they begin to say, Mr. Snell, we sense that you're not happy with the process. What can we do to sweeten the deal to make you feel good about moving into the house? I said, well, I had a thought about a fence in the backyard. My wife wanted an upgraded refrigerator. All the stuff that was out of our budget, God provided it at closing. I didn't always agree with it, but guess what? When you move without agreement, you will see the glory of God revealed. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? Second thing really quick that the story of Jonah teaches us, stay with me, friends. It teaches that certain storms are not for your destruction. They're for your direction. So Jonah goes down to Joppa. He pays the fare and gets in a boat so that he can go to the land of Tarshish. But understand that Jonah is not just trying to run from Nineveh. The Bible says that he is literally running from the presence of the Lord. And it's crazy because, man, they get on a boat and they are, the Bible says that God sends a strong wind into the sea. And the wind is so strong that it threatens the well-being of the ship. And even these pagan men begin to call each one on the name of their God. And see, the thing I need somebody to get, friends of mine, is that this storm is not a natural storm. That this storm is not because heat, uh, a cold front collided with a warm front. It's not because a low pressure system converged with a high pressure system. It is not a hurricane that has headwinds in front of it. In other words, this storm, my friends, has no meteorological definition because this storm is not a natural storm, but this storm is spiritual in origin. And one of the things that Ellen White says in Prophets and Kings is that as the boat is seized by the storm, what it does is it grips them in a particular location. In other words, what the storm does is it obstructs their movement. This storm, church, keeps them from getting where they're trying to go. This storm halts their momentum. The storm essentially holds them in place. In other words, church, this storm essentially pauses them. In other words, as they walk through this storm, there are times where storms would push you forward. There are times where storms will drive you backwards. There are times where storms will push you way off course. But this storm places them in the exact same locale so that no matter how they maneuver, they're looking at the same set of mountains and the same group of trees and the same lighthouse from whence there is no help. And so essentially what the storm does 
is he holds them in one particular place so that Lewis, no matter how hard they bail, it still got them in the same place. No matter how much cargo they dump, they're still stuck in the same place. They are literally like hamsters on a wheel that no matter how much motion they exert, they still find themselves in the same place. And understand there is a purpose in the storm because God's goal is not to destroy them. His goal at this point is to exhaust them. In other words, he just wants to get them tired. God just wants to weary them. He wants them to get to a place where they stop trying to maneuver and they stop trying to sail and they stop trying to manage it because God knows something about us. It is only when the humanity is depleted that divinity is invited. See, see, how many of us know that sometimes God puts you in a storm that you can't think your way out of? You can't buy your way out. You can't maneuver your way out. You can't hustle your way out. You can't network your way out. And see, sometimes God is waiting for you to get tired of your human aims and your human devices. He's trying to get you to a place where you look to the hills from whence come up your head and realize that your help comes from God. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? And see, let me just pause and say this real quick because, man, I need you to get, man, that, 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 that these guys realize that there is something different about this storm. Because, like, man, it's crazy because one scholar says that, man, as they're on this storm, the reason they realize that it's something different is because the strength of the storm is not commensurate with their outcome. This storm is so great that they're looking at it and saying, we should have been dead by now. They're looking at it and saying, we should have gone under by now. They're looking and saying, ain't no way we should have made it this long. They're looking at this thing and saying, man, this storm is toying with us. It tips us all the way over and snatches us back. It pushes us almost to the edge and brings us back. And they realize the storm is testing them. The storm is toying with them. The storm is tormenting them. In other words, the storm is trying to tell them something. And see, let me just say this real quick to the high-minded and presumptuous amongst us who survived a few storms in your life. I need you to understand that you didn't survive the storm because you were strong. You didn't get through the storm because you had skill. You didn't get through the storm because you had willpower. You didn't get through the storm because you knew somebody that knew somebody. You didn't get through the storm because of your own capability. The only reason you got through the storm was because it wasn't meant to destroy you. It was meant to direct you. And do I have at least five survivors that when you come through the storm, you ain't going to pat yourself on the back. You ain't going to say, look at what I have done. Can somebody testify that if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, that it was Jehovah that rescued you. It was God that provided for you. It was Jesus that protected you. It wasn't by might or by power, but it was Jesus that came to your rescue. And see, it's crazy, friends of mine, because literally, man, they, the, the storm is just trying to get them tired enough to realize where their help comes from. It's crazy. I remember one time watching a video of a, of a young lady who was in a drowning end of a pool. And once the lifeguard jumped in the pool, the lady was so frantic in uh, an attempt to save herself that what happened is, man, she became a danger to the lifeguard because she was flailing about. And it's crazy. You know what the lifeguard did is the lifeguard just fell back for a minute. 
The lifeguard stayed in close proximity, but he just fell back for a few moments. And it looks from the outside like he doesn't care. It looks from the outside like he's going to let her go down. It looks from the outside like he's indifferent to her plight. But I need you to know he's not indifferent. He's just waiting on her to get tired. Because as long as she's flailing, guess what? She can't be assisted. And so he's got to let her get to a place where she's about to sink, where she's got nothing else to give, and only then can she receive her help. And see, there's somebody that can sense that God is close by, but he's not helping. It's not because he won't help. He just needs you to get tired enough to let him step in and fight the battle. That's crazy because I'm looking at this. Man, I'm tripping because, man, I don't know what the spiritual pulse is of these men. I don't know, man, their full belief system. But, man, they, they got enough of a spiritual pulse to realize, man, that there is something different in this storm right here. Now, they realize that this one has a different bite and a different bend to it. They realize that this storm is spiritual in nature. And see, the thing I need somebody to get is that there is, help me, Lord. There is a purpose in the storm. You see, the storm is not meant to destroy them. Are y'all still with me, church? The storm is meant to intercept them and direct them where they're supposed to be. Now, remember, Jonah is not fleeing from Nineveh. He is running from the presence of the Lord so that the storm is designed to keep him from getting too far. The storm is designed to keep him from getting too far from God, and it's designed to aim him in the direction of God. And see, I need you to know that the storm is designed to tell Jonah something. And can I suggest today, friends, that there are some of us that are in a variety of types of storms. You see, there are some of us that are in a storm that's designed to teach us that we are going the wrong way. Some of us are in a storm that's letting us know that our path is off course. Some of us are in a storm because we're getting a little too far from God. Some of us are in a storm because, man, our lives have become a little bit too prayerless and sometimes you got to know that the storm has not come to destroy you it's not punishment it's not judgment it is simply God trying to turn you around before you get too far from him and so I need you to understand that the storm in some ways is God's last resort it is the last barrier to keep you from being destroyed because sometimes God says I couldn't reach you through my Holy Spirit He's saying, I couldn't reach you through conviction. I couldn't reach you through snail sermons. I couldn't get to you through your parents. I couldn't get to you through godly counsel. So the only way I could get to some of you is by turning your world upside down. And it's crazy because the nature of the storm in some ways is going to speak to the violation that God wants you to avoid so that some of us are in a financial storm because we've gotten too comfortable robbing God. Some of us are in a relational storm because the pull of romance is keeping you away from him. Some of us are in an emotional storm because we've forgotten that the joy of the Lord is to be our strength. Some of us are in a family storm because the family altars have been replaced by flat screens and entertainment centers. Some of us are in a storm with our children to teach us that the screen time should decrease and the prayer time should increase. I need us to understand that there is a purpose in the storm. And it's crazy because we look at the storm too often as judgment. Do you realize that the storm is literally God saying, Jonah, I won't give you up without a fight. It is the way God contends with Jonah. It is the way he pulls on Jonah. It is the way he preserves Jonah. And watch this, church. Y'all ain't going to rejoice with me here. But I need you to understand that the curse of God is not in the storm. 
I'm going to enjoy this all by myself. The curse of God was not in hostile water. The curse of God would have been in calm water. Because you know what calm water would have represented? Calm water would have simply meant that God had found a replacement for Jonah. If the water was calm, it would have simply meant that I'm done with Jonah. I'm over Jonah. I have no need for Jonah. I'm going to raise somebody up to do what Jonah refused to do. And let me pause to say to some of us, never confuse God's mercy as you being necessary. Beyonce said it best. Don't you ever get to thinking you're... I see who all the sinners are in the church right now. Thank you for revealing yourself. Amen. See, I need you to know that God doesn't need us. Oh, oh, he doesn't need us. He wants us. In other words, I need you to know that when he keeps the water hostile, it's because he's still striving with Jonah. It's because he's still dealing with Jonah. It's because he's saying, I haven't given up on Jonah. And I know you don't like to praise God in the storm, but the calm means that God has no more use for you. It means that God is done with you. But can somebody take a moment and say, Lord, I thank you for the storm. You've got to re interpret the data. You've got to reinterpret the information because the storm is the evidence that God is contending with you, that he's still calling you, that he still wants you, that he's still using you. I praise God not for calm waters, but for seasons of storm that drive me back to God. The Bible says here in Jonah chapter 1, and verse 10, can we go back to the book for just a moment? I need you to see this. The Bible says, then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may become for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. Watch this. And he said to them, are y'all looking at this church? Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become for you. For I know this great tempest is because of me. Verse 13, nevertheless, these men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Third thing this teaches, friends of mine, is don't let somebody else's drama sink you. <laughs> I told you I'm going to enjoy it if I have to do it all by myself. Are y'all hearing me today? Now, that's crazy, church, because this story, I ain't going to lie, it gets re weirder every time I read it. Like I, had, I literally read it through probably 30 times this week, line upon line, because there are sequences and there are decisions and there are ways of thinking that I just don't understand and I do not vibe with. In other words, I need you to get this, that there, man, this, this storm has an escalating scale of intensity. And, and it's crazy because they realize that it is spiritual in nature, but they grow more and more frustrated because their spiritual efforts are not able to nullify the spiritual storm. So literally, they go through, man, polling everybody to find out who knows a God that is powerful enough to stop the storm. So literally, they find Jonah asleep in the belly of the boat. They're like, dude, why are you still sleeping? You down here living your best life, and we are here about to perish. And man, they're like, man, who are you? Who, where are you from? What God you serve? Maybe your God is able to deliver us. Man, and they implore Jonah to call on his God, but man, you got to catch the absurdity that the man of God can't pray to God because he ain't speaking to God. In other words, the witnessing opportunity of the lifetime is squandered because of Jonah's pettiness. So they been, Jonah doesn't cast, he doesn't, he doesn't confess it first. So the Bible says they began casting lots, which is the, the ancient equivalent of drawing straws are y'all hearing me? Or, or, or flipping coins. And the Bible says that the lot falls on Jonah. And to his ever-living credit, at least at some point, Jonah kind of says, well, what had happened was, 
I was supposed to go to Tarshish, I mean to, to Nineveh, but I refused. I ran from the presence of the Lord, and he, and he raises his hand and says, this storm is because of me. He, he is forced to confess, I bought this drama to your boat. He's saying, my chaos is the reason y'all are about to sink. And it's crazy. So they kind of like, okay, what do we need to do to you so that the storm might get right with us? I ain't going to lie. I'll give him some credit because I might have told them something different. I might have been like, man, pray three times. <laughs> Click your heels. And say Jehovah backwards. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I mean, but, but to what Jonah's like, man, like if you want it to be okay, he says, throw me over the boat. Now, I don't really know kind of what they hear and why they're hesitant to do it. Maybe perhaps when you read their prayer in chapter 1, maybe they are afraid of God's judgment of what will happen if they throw the prophet of God overboard. But the prophet already said, if you want to live, you better throw me overboard. But do you notice what happens? There is this interesting misplaced loyalty that somehow goes down where the Bible says that they literally, instead of throwing Jonah overboard, the Bible says that they row even harder. And watch this, the harder they row, the more tempestuous the, so the storm actually becomes. I don't know what's going through their mind. They just like, yo, Jonah, we got you. Man, listen, I need you to know it's all for one and one for all. We need all hands on deck. They give everybody an assignment. They just like, man, we ride together. We die. Are y'all hearing me? He's like, listen, we're going to make it together. And the Bible says the harder they row, the more intense the storm becomes. And your boy Jonah's over in the corner like, hey guys, I don't know if y'all know who y'all up against. I've tried fighting him. And this is why I'm in this predicament right now. And they're just like, Jonah, no, we got you, man. We're going to make it together. And it's crazy because your boy Jonah's just leaning up against the edge of the boat. Man, and they're over there, man, casting off cargo and throwing off imported goods. And the storm gets worse. And Jonah's just like, I told you to throw me overboard. They literally take pails and they empty the boat of water as often as they can. And Jonah's just over there saying, I told you to throw me overboard. They literally are roaring with all the force they can muster. And the storm's intensity is greater than their effort. And at some point, Jonah has to put some bass in his voice and is like, dude, I told you. You got to throw me overboard. Now, notice this. That Jonah doesn't jump off the boat. Jonah's like, my mama ain't raised no fool. Ain't jumping off the boat. He's saying, you're going to have to throw me over the boat. And one of the things Jonah is teaching us is that drama will never remove itself. That drama ain't going to never go nowhere voluntarily. Drama has to be removed. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? And see, I need somebody to get that Jonah in this moment of watching them struggle while not removing himself is illustrating a lesson for us because he's saying to them, it doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how hard you row. It doesn't matter how much stuff you throw overboard. I need you to know the best thing you can do for yourself and the best thing you can do for me is to throw me off the boat. You see, friends, you know what this shows us? It shows us the danger of misplaced loyalty and what happens when you develop a savior complex. See, how many of us understand that saving Jonah wasn't their responsibility? 
Saving Jonah was God's responsibility. And the best thing they could do for Jonah and the welfare of the boat is to muster up the courage to throw Jonah overboard. Are y'all hearing me today? And see, I need somebody to understand that I believe in encouraging people. I believe in praying for people. I believe in investing in people. I believe in bearing long for people. But how many of us know that you can't save nobody if your name ain't Jesus and your title ain't Christ? You can't save nobody that don't want to be saved. Are y'all hearing me today? And see, it's crazy. It's going to seem like I'm lacking compassion. But how many of us are at a place where you got your own burdens and you got your own drama and you got so many of your own problems that you can't carry your own drama and somebody else's too? And see, this is crazy. You know what this is showing us, friends? Oh, this is going to be tough. I need you to realize that most of our drama is not circumstantial. It's relational. See, a lot of our drama is not brought to us by circumstance. A lot of our drama accompanies the people that we allow in our inner circle. And see, what God will do, friends of mine, is he will allow the source of drama at some point to be revealed in your life. But I need you to know that once God shows you the drama source, you've got to have the courage to deal with the source of the drama. Oh, y'all like them brand new on me today. Anybody ever seen people that are magnets for drama? You ever seen somebody that's just a magnet for chaos? That everywhere they go, things bottom out. Every time they show up, things get messy. Every time they come around, things begin to get tense. I need you to recognize that there are times where God reveals the sources of drama in your life. And I need you to be clear that the drama ain't going to never remove itself. It's not going to yield voluntarily. At some point, you've got to have the courage like the mariners on the boat to say, man, I love you. I'm doing this for you and for me. I've got to throw some sources of drama overboard so I can make it back to God. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? In other words, brother, if your homie sleeping on your couch is causing drama between you and your woman, then at some point you're going to have to erect some boundaries or throw homeboy overboard. Y'all mighty quiet. In other words, sister, if your girlfriend's counsel is causing drama in your house, you're going to have to throw up some boundaries or put homegirl overboard. Y'all mighty quiet today. If lending them money is keeping you broke and them dependent, at some point you're going to have to throw them overboard. Understand that if you always starting fight in fights that you didn't start, you're going to have to put up some boundaries or throw some folk overboard. If you got to be mad with them in order to be friends with them. You've got to throw some folk overboard. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? See, see, at some point, you're going to have to do some inventory in your life and realize on your boat the difference between the sails and the anchors. See, how many of us know that in every life there are some sails when they get underneath the wind of God, they push you where you're supposed to go. But there are some that are anchors planted by the enemy to halt your progress and keep you from becoming who God has ultimately ordained for you to become. And see, I need you to know, you'll never know the difference between a sail and an anchor until the wind starts blowing. And see, one of the greatest things of a storm is that the storm reveals who your friends actually are. It reveals who's for you and who's actually against you. Listen, I'm almost done. So it's crazy. Because God, God I mean, God, Jonah literally says, he's listen, like, guys, there's only one way to do it. You're going to have to toss me off the ship. And it's crazy because, man, they, they literally pray unto the Lord, Jonah's God. They're like, Lord, have mercy on us for what we're about to do. And man, I don't know if it's three or four of them that grab Jonah, they pick him up, and on one, two, three, 
And the Bible says that as soon as Jonah's body hits the water, all of a sudden the sea becomes calm. But that ain't even the best part of the story. Did you notice that the Bible says that God prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah? Oh, some of y'all missed your shout. See, the problem is that, see, you got to realize that when Jonah tells them to throw him over, Jonah is not looking for an escape plan. You realize that Jonah is planning for his own demise. As they are counting one, two, three, he's counting down to his last breath. Like Jonah assumes that this is where his story ends. Jonah is under the assumption that he's gone too far beyond the mercy of God. He is getting ready to face final judgment and consequence. In other words, he can't see. Uh, his eyes can't see. His ears can't hear. His heart has not received. What God has prepared for him. And as soon as Jonah's body hits the water, the Bible says a great whale swallows up Jonah. Now, some of y'all still looking funny because we thought the whale was punishment. But the whale was not punishment. The whale was protection. The whale was how God spared him. The whale was how God kept him. The whale is how God preserved him. Jonah was preparing to be destroyed, but mercy said not so. And he's showing Jonah, you can't just preach on your time. You can't live on your time. And because I'm God, you can't even die when you get ready. I'm in control of every area of your life. I'm the sovereign God. There is none before me. There's none beside me. There's none after me. I'm God all by myself and beside me. There is no other. Can there be anybody that prays God that he controls your seasons, controls your time? And I need you to know it looks like you may be about to go under, but God has prepared something to save you financially. There's a well that's going to save you medically. He's got a way of escape. Your eyes haven't seen it. Your ears haven't heard it. Neither has entered into the heart of man that which God has prepared for those who love him. So watch this. I ain't even got to the good part yet. So the word says that Jonah in chapter 2, as he goes into the belly of the fish, that he prays unto the Lord. The prayer is actually recorded. And the Bible says that after the third day, that the fish vomited Jonah out. Now, why is that important? Because Jesus in Matthew 12 says that as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so the Son of Man is going to be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, so that the way Jonah leaves the fish is a foreshadowing of how Jesus will leave the grave. And notice it didn't say the fish spit Jonah out. The word says he vomited him out. See, how many of us know that vomiting is not a voluntary act? <laughs> it's an involuntary act. See, vomiting is the result of some type of food poisoning or, or, or the remnants of the stomach going up and creating reflux. In other words, man, the, the whale was getting ready to digest, but when he tried to digest the servant of God, he began to gag. There was an aversion. He wanted to get him down, but guess what? He couldn't hold him down. So guess what, man? Involuntarily, he spit the servant of God back up on the side of the earth. Some of y'all still miss your shouts because how many of us know that after three days that death 
tried to digest Jesus. Oh, God. But remember, Jesus said, I don't just do resurrections. He says, I am resurrection. And so because death tried to digest the resurrection, that when he tried to get him in the belly, death found himself dry even. Death found himself coughing, trying to get air. Why? Because death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't contain him. See, I need you to know he didn't let him go by choice that when he tried to get him in the belly, he just threw Jesus up and Jesus came forward with all power in his hands. He's got the keys of death. He holds the keys of hell. He's got the keys of the grave. And can somebody praise him? Because death couldn't master him. Death couldn't control him. Death couldn't handle him. Death had to give him up because he's king of kings. He's lord of lords. He's the bright and morning star. He's the lily of the valley. He's the rose of Sharon. Ah, I call him Jesus. Can you call him Jesus? There's just something about that name. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? I wish I could have been there resurrection morning. Death is like, because he can't hold our Savior. And I need you to know there's going to be another vomiting when the trumpet blasts and the archangel shouts and God awakens those who are sleeping and the grave is going to have to throw up one last time so that those that have died in Christ are going to be raised in Christ and when he comes will forever reign with the Lord of glory. Are you hearing me today, friends? But ultimately, the motif of this message is this. It is saying we got to get to a place, friends of mine, where we just stop being submitted in sections. We got to stop submitting portions. You can't be all the way in if you only submit in segments. But you got to get to a place where, where Jonah eventually gets to, where he says, Lord, everything I am and everything I have, I surrender it all and I give it over to you. See, there are some of us, man, that submit Sabbath, but you ain't got no submission on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Some of us may give God faithfully that 10%, but I need you to know that 90% still belongs to him too. Some of us have not submitted really any of our time to relationship with God or using our gifts to advance his kingdom. And so I need you to know the only folk that are going to make it all the way into heaven are those who are all the way in right now. I don't want to be a volunteer of Christ. I want to be a disciple of Christ. I don't want to be a Jesus fan. I want to be a Jesus follower. And again, I need you to realize it's not about how good or how bad or how righteous, how wicked. It's about how submitted you are to him. And I need somebody to understand that submission is not that one thing you said a long time ago before you got baptized. But is there anybody that recognizes you got to submit to God every day of your life? Every day I've got to submit a new and a fresh. I've got to renew the lease on my submission to him. And again, submission, I need you to make sure you take home what the definition is. It is not man, just slavery. It's not man where God obfuscates choice. It is simply a voluntary alignment with authority. Because I believe in his character. He is good. I submit because I believe in his mission, the gospel to the world. 
I submit to God because I believe in his ability. He does all things well. I submit to God because I believe in his judgment. He knows what is best for you and what is best for me. I need somebody to know, man, that even the best plans you have for yourself fall short of what God has planned for you. Ellen White says, higher than the highest human thought can conceive. Oh, wait, where the church at today? I, I, I need to go out of town. Look, higher than the highest human thought can conceive is God's ideal for his children. But you'll never get the higher than the highest human thought. You'll never get the exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think if you're still trying to plot your own course and chart your own boat. At some point, you just got to sit in the back seat and say, Jesus, take the wheel. See, this message, friends of mine, I know it's, it's hard in parts to hear, but I'm calling us to a radical faith, and what radical faith shows up in is, man, a radical submission because we have trust in him. Do we trust him today? Do we believe in his character? Do we believe in his mission? Do we believe in his ability? Do we believe that he knows what is best for us? So even the bad things that are permitted will ultimately be worked out for your good. These storms have not come to destroy you, but there, there is a certain element of it that's trying to redirect you so you don't get too far from the presence of the Lord. Are you hearing me today? So right now, the praise team is going to minister in song, and then I'm going to come back and invite somebody to make a decision in the direction of Jesus Christ. trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to trust upon his promise just to know the said the Lord Jesus Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and all, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, Trust him more, Jesus, Jesus, hey, precious Jesus, how I proved him all and all, oh,
Have you ever dreaded the start of a new week? Has the start of a new week ever felt too big for you? I want to help you out with that. Breath of Life presents Fresh Start Sunday. It's a series of programs designed to help you face the new week with a reset, a kickstart, to just begin with a whole new energy. Every first and third Sunday, I invite you to join me in the Scripture Lab. When I'm in the lab, we're going to be testing, breaking down, and applying the Word of God. It's going to be a space where we answer your questions, settle disputes, and help you come to conclusions about doctrine and larger social issues. Every second Sunday, I invite you to join Gianna and myself as we begin a series of conversations around dating and relationships entitled Points of View. We're going to be sharing from our own experience and we're gonna be joined by an array of experts and panelists designed to help build us up and be strengthened in the areas of dating and marriage. And every fourth Sunday is what we're calling Vision Sunday. Pastor Nugent and I are gonna be reaching out to pastors, ministry leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, writers, inventors, to make sure that those visions don't get stuck in your head but that they might be able to be implemented in your daily experience. Friends, we're done fearing the new week. 
We're done dreading what's to come. We're going to start the week with hope, beginning the day with encouragement and clarity, because the best way to have a great finish is to have a fresh start. Join us starting in the month of July, every Sunday at 10 a.m. I look forward to seeing you for a fresh start. What's good, family? One of the things that makes the faith journey hard is incrementalism. It's where we test God, where we try God, where we try to ease our way into it. But I need you to know that faith doesn't work in increments. The faith journey only works when you go all the way in. I wanna invite you to join me on August 26th as we begin a new teaching series entitled All The Way In. It's a call away from middle of the road Christianity, but to be fully committed and invested in Jesus Christ. We're gonna spend several weeks looking at Bible characters who went all the way in with Jesus. And then I wanna encourage you to join us on Sunday, August 27th, as we begin 21 days of prayer. We're gonna be utilizing my book, All the Way In. It's a 21 day guide to spiritual revolution. We're gonna meet each Monday through Friday at six o'clock a.m. online. And then we'll meet Saturday and Sundays, Saturdays at 8 a.m., Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. It's gonna be a powerful time of prayer, praise, testimony, and encouragement. The body of Christ is gonna be built up in every needed way. Listen, I need you to know, man, the spiritual journey doesn't work when you're part of the way in. It doesn't work if you're most of the way in. It only works when you go all the way in. If you wanna get a copy of the book, All the Way In, if you're in Huntsville, go to the Oakwood University Church Market, if you're outside of the city of Huntsville, go to our website, go to our market store at www.breathoflife.tv. For the past 49 years, Breath of Life has been presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ from a contemporary urban perspective. In 2023, we plan to grow our reach and your donations are what help make that possible. This year, our major goal is to launch our Breath of Life weekly broadcast into five new cities. In addition, we're excited to introduce our new Breath of Life Kids platform with original content created with your little ones in mind. We'll continue with innovative programming, dynamic preaching, and sharing the gospel through evangelistic campaigns. Here are the five ways that you can give. You can give online at breathoflife.tv by mail at P.O. Box 5960, Huntsville, Alabama, 35814. By phone at area code 256-929-6460 or by texting the phrase, give the number two B-O-L-T-V to 1-888-364-GIVE or by cash app at dollar sign Breath of Life TV. Every single dollar you give goes right back into the ministry and allows us to share the good news of Jesus Christ all over the world. We pray that God's favor will overtake you as a result of your generous gifts to Breath of Life. God bless you.